This is Karl Marx's、um, correspondence to Dr. Ludwig Kugelman.、Uh, so it's a series of letters. I'm going to read Lenin's introduction to the 1907 edition of Letters to Dr. Ludwig Kugelman first. Preface to the Russian translation of Karl Marx's letters to Dr. Kugelman、um, by Vladimir Lenin. Our purpose in issuing as a separate pamphlet the full collection of Marx's letters to Kugelman, published in the German Social Democratic Weekly Newsite, is to acquaint the Russian public more closely with Marx and Marxism. As was to be expected, a good deal of space in Marx's correspondence is devoted to personal matters. This is exceedingly valuable material for the biographer. But for the general public and for the Russian working class in particular, those passages in the letters which contain theoretical and political material are infinitely more important. In the revolutionary period we are now passing through, it is particularly instructive for us to make a careful study of this material, which reveals Marx as a man who responded directly to all questions of the labor movement and world politics. The editors of n e w s i t e are quite right in saying that we are elevated by an acquaintance with the personality of men whose thoughts and wills took shape in the period of great upheavals. Such an acquaintance is doubly necessary to the Russian socialist in 1907, for it provides a wealth of very valuable material, indicating the direct tasks confronting socialists in every revolution through which a country passes. Russia is experiencing a great upheaval at this very moment. In the present Russian Revolution, the Social Democrat should more and more frequently pattern his policy after that of Marx in the comparatively stormy 60s. We shall therefore permit ourselves to make only brief mention of those passages in Marx's correspondence that are of particular importance from the theoretical standpoint. And shall deal in greater detail with his revolutionary policy as a representative of the proletariat. Of outstanding interest as a contribution to a fuller and more profound understanding of Marxism is the letter of July 11th, 1868. In the form of a polemic against the vulgar economists, Marx in this letter very clearly expounds his conception of what is called the labor theory of value. Those very objections to Marx's theory of value, which naturally arise in the minds of the least trained readers of capital, and for this reason are most eagerly seized upon by the common or garden representatives of professorial bourgeois science, are here analyzed by Marx briefly, simply, and with remarkable lucidity. Marx here shows the road he took and the road to be taken towards elucidation of the law of value. He teaches us his method, using the most common objections as illustrations. He makes clear the connection between such a purely, it would seem, theoretical and abstract question as the theory of value and the interest of the ruling classes, which must be to perpetuate confusion. It is only to be hoped that everyone who begins to study Marx and read Capital will read and reread this letter when studying the first and most difficult chapters of that book. Other passages in the letters that are very interesting from the theoretical standpoint are those in which Marx passes judgment on various writers. When you read these opinions of Marx, vividly written, full of passion, and revealing a profound interest in all the great ideological trends, and in an analysis of them, you realize that you are listening to the words of a great thinker. Apart from the remarks on Ditskin, made in passing, the comments on the Proudhonists deserve particular attention from the reader. The brilliant young bourgeois intellectuals who dash into the thick of the proletariat at times of social upheaval and are incapable of acquiring the standpoint of the working class or of carrying on persistent and serious work among the rank and file of the proletarian organizations are depicted with remarkable vividness in a few strokes of the pen. Take the comment on During, which, as it were, anticipates the contents of the famous Anti During. Written by Engels in conjunction with Marx nine years later. There is a Russian translation of this book by Zetterbaum, which unfortunately is not only guilty of omissions, but is simply a poor translation with mistakes. Here, too, we have the comment on Thunin, which likewise touches on Ricardo's theory of rent. 
Marx had already in 1868 emphatically rejected Ricardo's errors, which he finally refuted in volume three of Capital, published in 1894, but which to this very day are repeated by the revisionists. From our ultra-bourgeois and even black-hundred Mr. Bulgakov to the almost orthodox Maslov. Interesting, too, is the comment on Buchner, with an appraisal of vulgar materialism and of the superficial nonsense copied from Lang, the usual source of professorial bourgeois philosophy. Let us pass to Marx's revolutionary policy. There is among social democrats in Russia a surprisingly widespread Philistine conception of Marxism, according to which a revolutionary period, which its specific forms of struggle and its special proletarian tasks is almost an anomaly, while the constitution and an extreme opposition are the rule. In no other country in the world at this moment is there such a profound revolutionary crisis as in Russia, and in no other country are there Marxists, belittlers and vulgarizers of Marxism, who take up such a skeptical and Philistine attitude towards the revolution. From the fact that the revolution is bourgeois in content, they draw the shallow conclusion that the bourgeoisie is the driving force of the revolution, that the tasks of the proletariat in this revolution are of an ancillary, not independent character, and that proletarian leadership of the revolution is impossible. How excellently Marx in his letters to Kugelman exposes this shallow interpretation of Marxism. Here is a letter dated April 6th, 1866. At that time, Marx had finished his principal work. He had given his final judgment on the German Revolution of 1848, 14 years before this letter was written. He had himself, in 1850, renounced his socialist illusions that a socialist revolution was impending in 1848. And in 1866, when only just beginning to observe the growth of new political crises, he writes, Will our Philistines, he is referring to the German bourgeois liberals, at last realize that without a revolution which removes the Habsburgs and Hohenzollerns, there must finally come another 30 years war. There's not a shadow of illusion here that the impending revolution, it took place from above, not from below as Marx had expected, would remove the bourgeoisie and capitalism, but a most clear and precise statement that it would remove only the Prussian and Austrian monarchies. And what faith in this bourgeois revolution, what revolutionary passion of a proletarian fighter who realizes the vast significance the bourgeois revolution has for the progress of the socialist movement. Noting a very interesting social movement three years later, on the eve of the downfall of the Napoleonic Empire in France, Marx says in a positive outburst of enthusiasm that the Parisians are making a regular study of their, decent rev their recent revolutionary past in order to prepare themselves for the business of the impending new revolution. In describing the struggle of classes revealed in this study of the past, Marx concludes, and so the whole historical witch's cauldron is bubbling. When will our country, Germany, be so far? Such is the lesson to be learned from Marx by the Russian Marxist intellectuals, who are debilitated by skepticism, dulled by pedantry, have a penchant for penitent speeches, rapidly tire of the revolution and yearn as for a holiday for the interment of the revolution and its replacement by constitutional prose. From the theoretician and leader of the proletarians, they should learn faith in the revolution, the ability to call on the working class to fight for its immediate revolutionary aims to the last, and a firmness of spirit which admits of no faint heart, no faint hearted whimpering following temporary setbacks of the revolution. The pedants of Marxism think that this is all ethical twaddle, romanticism, and lack of a sense of reality. No, gentlemen, this is the combination of revolutionary theory and revolutionary policy, without which Marxism becomes Brentanoism, Struvism, and Sombardism. The Marxian doctrine has fused the theory and practice of the class uh, struggle into one inseparable whole. And he is no Marxist who takes a theory that soberly states the objective situation and distorts it into a justification of the existing order, and even goes to the length of trying to adopt himself as quickly as possible to every temporary decline in the revolution, to discard revolutionary illusions as quickly as possible, and to turn to realistic tinkering. 
in times that were most peaceful, seemingly idyllic, as Marx expressed it, and wretchedly stagnant, as Newsite put it, Marx was able to sense the approach of revolution and to rouse the proletariat to a consciousness of its advanced revolutionary tasks. Our Russian intellectuals who vulgarize Marx in a Philistine manner in the most revolutionary times teach the proletariat a policy of passivity, of submissively drifting in with the current, of timidly supporting the most unstable elements of the fashionable liberal party. Marx's assessment of the commune crowns the letters to Kugelman, and this assessment is particularly valuable when compared with the methods of the Russian right-wing social democrats. Plekhanov, who after December 1905 faint-heartedly exclaimed, they should not have taken up arms, had the modesty to compare himself to Marx. Marx, says he, also put the brakes on the revolution in 1870. Yes, Marx also put the brakes on the revolution, but see what a gulf lies between Plekhanov and Marx in Plekhanov's own comparison. In November 1905, a month before the first revolutionary wave in Russia had reached its climax, Plekhanov, far from emphatically warning the proletariat, spoke directly of the necessity to learn to use arms and to arm. Yet, when the struggle flared up a month later, Plekhanov, without making the slightest attempt to analyze its significance, its role in the general course of events, and its connection with previous forms of struggle, hastened to play the part of a penitent intellectual and exclaimed, they should not have taken up arms. In September 1870, six months before the Commune, Marx gave a direct warning to the French workers. Insurrection would be an act of desperate folly, he said in the well-known Address of the International. He exposed in advance the nationalistic illusions of the possibility of a movement in the spirit of 1792. He was able to say, not after the event, but many months before, don't take up arms. And how did he behave when this hopeless cause, as he himself had called it in September, began to take practical shape in March 1871? Did he use it, as Plekhanov did the December events, to take a dig at his enemies, the Proudhonists and Blankists, who were leading the commune? Did he begin to scold like a schoolmistress and say, I told you so, I warned you, this is what comes of your romanticism, your revolutionary ravings? Did he preach to the communards, as Plekhanov did to the December fighters, the sermon of the smug Philistine, you should not have taken up arms? No. On April 12, 1871, Marx writes an enthusiastic letter to Kugelman, a letter which we would like to see hung in the home of every Russian social democrat and of every literate Russian worker. In September 1870, Marx had called the insurrection an act of desperate folly, but in April, in April 1871, when he saw the mass movement of the people, he watched it with the keen attention of a participant in great events marking a step forward in the historic revolutionary movement. This is an attempt, he says, to smash the bureaucratic military machine and not simply to transfer it to different hands. And he has words of the highest praise for the heroic Paris workers led by the Proudhonists and Blankists. What elasticity, he writes, what, historic, what historical initiative, what a capacity for sac sacrifice in these Parisians. History has no like example of a like greatness. The historical initiative of the masses was what Marx prized above everything else. Uh, if only our Russian social democrats would learn from Marx how to appreciate the historical initiative of the Russian workers and peasants in October and December 1905. Compare the homage paid to the historical initiative of the masses by a profound thinker who foresaw failure six months ahead in the lifeless, soulless, pedantic. They should not have taken up arms. Are these not as far apart as heaven and earth? And like a participant in the mass struggle, to which he reacted with all his characteristic ardor and passion, Marx, then living in exile in London, set to work to criticize the immediate steps of the recklessly brave Parisians who were ready to storm heaven. Ah, how our present realist whisikers among the Marxists, who in 1906-07 are deriding revolutionary romanticism in Russia, would have sneered at Marx at the time. How people would have scoffed at a materialist, an economist, an enemy of utopias, who pays homage to an attempt to, st to storm heaven. 
what tears, condescending smiles, or commiseration these men in mufflers would have bestowed upon him for his rebel tendencies, utopianism, etc., etc., and for his appreciation of a heaven-storming movement. But Marx was not inspired with the wisdom of the small fry who are afraid to discuss the technique of the higher forms of revolutionary struggle. It is precisely the technical problems of the insurrection that he discussed. Defense or attack, he asked, as if the military operations were taking place just outside London. And he decided that it must certainly be attack. They should have marched at once on Versailles. This was written in April 1871, a few weeks before the great and bloody May. They should have marched at once on Versailles. The insurgents should, those who had begun the act of desperate folly, of storming heaven. They should not have taken up arms in December 1905 in order to oppose by force the first attempts to take away the liberties that had been won. Yes, Plekhanov had good reason to compare himself to Marx. Second mistakes. Second mistake, Marx said, continuing his technical criticism. The Central Committee, the Military Command, note this, the reference is to the Central Committee of the National Guard, surrendered its power too soon. Marx knew how to warn the leaders against a premature rising, but his attitude towards the heaven-storming proletariat was that of a practical advisor, of a participant in the struggle of the masses, who were raising the whole movement to a higher level in spite of the false theories and mistakes of Blanqui and Proudhon. However that may be, he wrote, the present rising in Paris, even if it be crushed by the wolves, swine and vile, um, curs of the old society, is the most glorious deed of our party since the June insurrection. And without concealing from the proletariat a single mistake of the commune, Marx dedicated to this heroic deed a work which to this very day serves as the, as the best guide in the fight for heaven and as a frightful bugbear to the liberal and radical swine. Plekhanov dedicated to the December events a work which has become practically the Bible of the cadets. Yes, Plekhanov had good reason to compare himself to Marx. Kugelman apparently replied to Marx expressing certain doubts, referring to the hopelessness of the struggle and to realism as opposed to romanticism. At any rate, he compared the commune in insurrection to the peaceful demonstration in Paris on June 13, 1849. Marx immediately severely lectured Kugelman. World history, he wrote, would indeed be very easy to make if the struggle were taken up only on condition of infallibly favorable chances. In September 1870, Marx called the insurrection an act of desperate folly. But when the masses rose, Marx wanted to march with them, to learn with them in the process of the struggle, and not to give them bureaucratic admonitions. He realized that to attempt in advance to calculate the chances with complete accuracy would be quackery or hopeless pedantry. When he valued above everything else, or what he valued above everything else, was that the working class heroically and self-sacrificingly took the initiative in making world history. Marx regarded world history from the standpoint of those who make it without being in a position to calculate the chances infallibly beforehand, and not from the standpoint of an intellectual Philistine who moralizes. It was easy to foresee they should not have taken up. Marx was also able to appreciate that there are moments in history when a desperate struggle of the masses even for a hopeless cause, is essential for the further schooling of these masses and their training for the next struggle. Such a statement of the question is quite incomprehensible and even alien in principle to our present-day quasi-Marxists, who like to take the name of Marx in vain, to borrow only his estimate of the past and not his ability to make the future. Plekhanov did not even think of it when, we set out, when he set out after December 1905 to put the brakes on. But it is precisely this question that Marx raised, without in the least forgetting that he himself in September 1870 regarded insurrection as an act of desperate folly. <clears throat> the bourgeois canaille of Versailles, he wrote, presented the Parisians with the alternative of either taking up the fight or succumbing without a struggle. The demoralization of the working class in the latter case would have been a far greater misfortune than the succumbing of any number of leaders. And with this, we shall conclude our brief review of the lessons in a policy worthy of the proletariat, which Marx teaches in his letters to Kugelman. 
The working class of Russia has already proved once and will prove again more than once that it is capable of storming heaven. Okay, so this is, um, hold on. So this is Marx's letter to Kugelman um, from March 1868, or March 6th, 1868. There is something touching about Thunin, a Mecklenburg junker, true with a German training and thinking, who treats his estate as tello as the land, and Mecklenburg Schwerin as the town, and who, proceeding from these premises, with the help of observation, the differential calculus, practical accounting, etc., constructs for himself the Ricardian theory of rent. It is at once worthy of respect and at the same time ridiculous. I can now understand the curiously embarrassed tone of Air During's criticism. He is ordinarily a most bumptious, cheeky boy who sets up as a revolutionary in political economy. He has done two things. He has published, firstly, proceeding from Carey, a critical foundation of political economy, about 500 pages, and secondly, a new natural dialectic against the Hegelian. My book has buried him from both sides. He gave it notice because of his hatred for Rosher, etc. For the, for the rest, half intentionally and half from lack of insight, he commits deceptions. He knows very well that my method of development is not Hegelian, since I am a materialist and Hegel is an idealist. Hegel's dialectic is the basic form of all dialectic, but only after it has been stripped of its mystical form, and it is precisely this which distinguishes my method. As for Ricardo, it really hurt Air During that in my treatment of Ricardo, the weak points in him, which Carey and a hundred others before him pointed out, do not even exist. Consequently, he attempts in mauvaise foi to burden me with all Ricardo's limitations. But never mind, I must be grateful to the man since he is the first expert who has said anything at all. In the second volume, which will certainly never appear if my health does not improve, property and land will be one of the subjects dealt with, competition only in so far as it required for the treatment of the other, other themes. During my illness, which I hope will soon cease altogether, I was unable to write, but I got down an enormous amount of stuff, statistical and otherwise, which in itself would have been enough to make people sick who are not used to that sort of fodder and do not possess stomachs accustomed to, di to di digesting it rapidly. My circumstances are very harassing, as I have been unable to do any additional work which would bring in money. And yet certain appearances must be maintained for the children's sake. If I did not have these two damned volumes to produce, and in addition to look for an English publisher, which can be done only in London, I would go to Geneva, where I could live very well with the means at my disposal. Marx to Kugelman. Um, this letter is dated July 11th, 1868. Every child knows a nation which ceased to work, I will not say for a year, but even for a few weeks, would perish. Every child knows, too, that the masses of products corresponding to the different needs required different and quantitatively determined masses of the total labor of society that this necessity of the distribution of social labor in definite proportions cannot possibly done away with, be done away with by a particular form of social production, but can only change the mode of its appearance, is self-evident. No natural laws can be done away with. What can change in historically different circumstances is only the form in which these laws assert themselves. And the form in which this proportional distribution of labor asserts itself in the state of society where the interconnection of social labor is manifested in the private exchange of the individual products of labor is precisely the exchange value of these products. Science consists precisely in demonstrating how the law of value asserts itself, so that if one wanted at the ver very beginning to explain all the phenomena which seemingly contradict that law, one would have to present science before science. It is precisely Ricardo's mistake that in his first chapter on value, from On the Principles of Political Economy and Taxation, he takes as given all possible and still to be developed categories in order to prove their conformity with the law of value. On the other hand, as you correctly assumed, the history of the theory certainly shows that the concept of the value relation has always been the same, 
more or less clear, hedged more or less with illusions, or scientifically more or less definite. Since the thought process itself grows out of conditions, is itself a natural process. Thinking that really comprehends must always be the same, and can vary only gradually, according to maturity of development, including the development of the organ by which the thinking is done. Everything else is drivel. The vulgar economist has not the faintest idea that the actual everyday exchange relations cannot be directly identical with the magnitudes of value. The essence of bourgeois society consists precisely in this, that a priori there is no conscious social regulation of production. The rational and naturally necessary asserts itself only as a blindly working average. And then the vulgar economist thinks he has made a great discovery when, as against the revelation of the inner interconnection, he proudly claims that in appearance things look different. In fact, he boasts that he holds fast to appearance and takes it for the ultimate. Why then have any science at all? But the matter has also another background. Once the interconnection is grasped, all theoretical belief in the permanent necessity of existing conditions collapses before their collapse in practice. Here, therefore, it is absolutely in the interest of the ruling classes to perpetuate a senseless confusion. And for what other purpose are the psychophantic babblers paid who have no other, who have no other scientific trump to play save that in political economy one should not think at all. But set is super key, enough and to spare. In any case, it shows what these priests of the bourgeoisie have come down to, when workers and even manufacturers and merchants understand my book, Capital, and find their way about it, about in it, while these learned scribes complain that I make excessive demands on their understanding. Next letter is dated December 12th, 1868. I am also returning Ditskin's portrait. The story of his life is not quite what I had imagined, imagined it to be, although I always had a feeling that he was not a worker like Icarius. It is true that the sort of philosophic outlook which he has worked out for himself requires a certain amount of peace and leisure, which the everyday workman does not enjoy. I have got two very good workmen living in New York, A. Vaught, shoemaker, and Siegfried Meyer, a mining engineer, both from Berlin. A third workman who could give lectures on my book is Lochner, a carpenter, common working man, who has been here in London about 15 years. Tell your wife I never suspected her of being one of Generalis Gex's subordinates. My question was only intended as a joke. In any case, ladies cannot complain of the International, for it has elected a lady, Madame Law, to be a member of the General Council. Oh, Marx. Joking aside, great progress was evident in the last Congress of the American Labor Union, in that, among other things, it treated working women with complete equality. While in this respect the English, and still more the gallant French, are burdened with a spirit of narrow-mindedness. Anybody who knows anything of history knows that great social changes are impossible without the feminine ferment. Social progress can be measured exactly by the social position of the fair sex, the ugly ones included. Marx, you bastard. That wasn't nice. Um, this letter is dated March 3rd, 1869. A very interesting movement is going on in France. The Parisians are making a regular study of their recent revolutionary past in order to prepare themselves for the business of the impending new revolution. First, the origin of the empire, then the coup d'etat of December. This has been completely forgotten, just as the reaction in Germany succeeded in stamping out the memory of 1848 to 49. That is why Tenot's book on the coup d'etat attracted such enormous attention in Paris and the provinces that in a short time they went through 10 impressions. They were followed by dozens of other books on the same period. It was all the rage and therefore soon became a speculative business for the publishers. These books were written by the opposition. Tenot, for example, is one of the siècle, century men. I mean the liberal bourgeois paper, not our century. All the liberal and illiberal scoundrels who belong to the official opposition patronize this movement. Also, the Republican Democrats, people like, for example, Telescalus, 
formerly LeDrew Rollins' adjutant, and now as a Republican patriarch, editor of the Paris Reve. Up to the present, everybody has been reveling in these posthumous disclosures, or rather reminiscences, everybody who is not Bonapartist. But then came the other side of the medal. First of all, the French government itself got the renegade Hippolyte Castille to publish Les Massacres de Juin, um, I don't know how to say the number in French, 1848. This was a blow for Thiers, Fallou, Marie, Jules Favre, Jules Simon, Peloton, etc. In short, for the chiefs of what is called in France, uh, l'Union Libérale, who want to wangle the next elections, the infamous old dogs. Then, however, came the Socialist Party, which exposed the opposition and the Republican the Republican Democrats of the old style. Among others, the Morel, Les Hommes de 1848, <laughs> <laughs> and l'opposition. <laughs> Vermorel is a prudonist. Finally came the blankists, for example, G. Tridon, Gironde et Girondin. And so the whole historic witch's cauldron is bubbling. When shall we be so far? So the next letter is dated April 4th, 1871. <clears throat> oh. But it says, Marks to Wilhelm Libnet. So, I'm going to read it. But I'm not sure if this is supposed to be to Libnet. Or Kugelman. But anyway, it appears that the defeat of the Parisians was their own fault, but a fault which really arose from their too great honnête hun <laughs> or decency. The Central Committee and later the Commune gave the mischievous abortion fierce time to centralize hostile forces. In the first place, by their folly in trying not to start civil war as if Thiers had not started it by his attempt at the, for at the forcible disarming of Paris, as if the National Assembly, which was only summoned to decide the question of war or peace with the Prussians, had not immediately declared war on the Republic. In order that the appearance of having usurped power should not attain to them, they lost precious moments. They should immediately have advanced on Versailles after the defeat of the reaction in Paris, by the election of the Commune, in the organization of which, etc., cost yet more time. You must not believe a word of all the stuff you may see in the papers about the internal events in Paris. It is all lies and deception. Never has the vileness of bourgeois journalism displayed itself more brilliantly. It is highly characteristic that the German Unity Emperor and Unity Parliament in Berlin appear not to exist at all for the outside world. Every breath of wind that stirs in Paris excites more interest. You must carefully follow what is happening in the Danubian principalities. If the revolution in France is temporarily defeated, the movement there can only be suppressed for a short time. There will be a new business of war for Europe beginning in the East, and Romania will offer the Orthodox Tsar the first pretext for it, the lookout on that side. Next letter is dated April 12th, 1871. Dear Kugelman, your medical advice was effective insofar as I have consulted my Dr. Madison and have for the present put myself under his care. He says, however, that my lungs are in excellent condition and the cough is due to bronchitis, etc. It probably also affects the liver. Yesterday we received the by no means soothing news that Lafargue, not Laura, was at present in Paris. If you look at the last chapter of my 18th Brumaire, you will find that I say that the next attempt of the French Revolution will be no longer, as before, to transfer the bureaucratic military machine from one hand to another, but to smash it. And this is essential for every real people's revolution on the continent. And this is what our heroic party comrades in Paris are attempting. 
What elasticity, what historical initiative, what a capacity for sacrifice in these Parisians. After six months of hunger and ruin caused rather by internal treachery than by the external enemy, they rise beneath Prussian bayonets as if there had never been a war between France and Germany and the enemy were not at the gates of Paris. History has no like example of a like greatness. If they are defeated, only their good nature will be to blame. They should have marched at once on Versailles. After first Vinoy and then the reactionary section of the Paris National Guard had themselves retreated. The right moment was missed because of conscientious scruples. They did not want to start the civil war as if that mischievous abortion Thiers had not already started the civil war with his attempt to disarm Paris. Second mistake, the Central Committee surrendered its power too soon to make way for the Commune. Again, from a too honorable scrupulosity, however that may be, the present rising in Paris, even if it be crushed by the wolves, swine, and vile curs of the old society, is the most glorious deed of our party since the June insurrection in Paris. Compare the, these Parisians storming heaven with the slave to heaven of the German Prussian Holy Roman Empire, with its posthumous masquerades, reeking of the barracks, the church, cabbage junkerdom, and above all, of the Philistine. A propos, in the official publication of the list of those receiving direct subsidies from Louis Bonaparte's treasury, there's a note that Vaught received 40,000 francs in August 1859. I've informed Libnick of the FET for further use. You can send me Haxthausen's book for lately. I have been receiving undamaged various pamphlets, etc., not only from Germany, but even from Petersburg. Thanks for the various newspapers you sent me. Please let me have more of them, for I want to write something about Germany, the Reichstag, etc. Best regards to the Countess and Koch. Kotschen, yours KM. And um, the last letter is dated April 17th, 1871. Dear cool woman, your letter duly received. Just at present, I have my hands full, hence only a few words. How can you compare petty, petty bourgeois demonstrations a la 13th of June, 1849, etc., with the present struggle in Paris is quite incomprehensible to me. World history would indeed be very easy to make if the struggle were taken up only on condition of infallibly favorable chances. It would, on the other hand, be a very mystical nature if accidents played no part. These accidents themselves fall naturally into the general course of development and are compensated again by other accidents. But acceleration and delay are very dependent upon such accidents, which included the accident of the character of those who, who at first at the head of the who at first stand at the head of the movement. The decisive unfavorable accident this time is by no means to be found in the general conditions of French society, but in the presence of the Prussians in France and their position right before Paris. Of this the Parisians were well aware, but of this the bourgeois canaille of Versailles were also well aware. Precisely for that reason, they presented the Parisians with the alternative of taking up the fight of succumbing without a struggle. In the latter case, the demoralization of the working class against the capitalist class and its state has entered upon a new phase with the struggle in Paris. Whatever the immediate results may be, a new point of departure of world historic importance has been gained. Adieu, KM.